Hello, my name is Russell Myers. Welcome to Issues Unite. So, one of the difficult things about uh, constructing this series is uh, prioritizing the sequence of the subjects involved. I'm choosing this as the second subject for a very good reason. If the stock markets were actually revised, as I suggested in the first substantive uh, piece, then certain things would happen. We would have to be prepared for the response of capitalist speculators. Financial bubbles are never called bubbles by Wall Street loyal economists and investment advisors, except in retrospect. The internet bubble, bubble was not called a bubble until after it broke. The 2008 financial crisis was not called a bubble until after it broke. Those are just the most recent and obvious examples. These people will not call a bubble a bubble until after the fact because up until that point they are trying to get your money. By the time the bubble does break, well, you know who doesn't have your money? You. All right, if we took away the stock market as a means of speculation and control of the economy, then capitalists would move immediately to control the economy by other means. One of the first things they would do is divert their investments toward real estate equity. Of course, they have already been doing this over decades, but especially in recent years, leading and that has accelerated tremendously since the beginning of 2020, leading to the real estate bubble that we see at this very moment. Investors have been buying up re residential properties at breakneck speed, driving up the cost of real estate to levels never seen before. Up until the beginning of 2020, the same investors were buying up real estate, such as office buildings and uh, shopping malls, which are now sitting largely empty. Just All right. So, in the United States, as well as some other countries, this residential real estate bubble has been aided and abetted by the actions of the Federal Reserve, which has been buying mortgage-backed securities residential mortgage-backed mortgage securities by hundreds of billions of dollars each and every month. The Federal Reserve now owns more residential property in this manner than any entity in existence outside of China. Yet somehow many Americans view corporate banks owning this much property as acceptable while having a government own this much property as an atrocity. Understand clearly that capitalists are the ones who will and have evicted millions of Americans from their residences due to personal financial difficulties on the part of the residents. It has not been the government evicting people from their homes. It has been capitalists. It was capitalists who evicted over 5 million families during the financial crisis of 2008-2009, even after it was capitalists who created that crisis, and while those same capitalists were being bailed out by the U.S. government, by the U.S. taxpayers, and while those being evicted were ignored. Right now, we have over 600,000 homeless people living in America. At least 20% 20 of, 20 of those homeless are children under the age of 18. Homelessness is not always what it sounds like. One does not have to live in a tent, in their vehicle, or under a bridge to be homeless. Being declared homeless means that you have no long-term stable residence. A person or family can be considered homeless if they must depend on other family, friends, or acquaintances for short-term shelter. Or if they stay in short- and long-term stay hotels. 
In each case, their living arrangement is unstable and there is no long-term lease agreement, mortgage, etc. Rent can go up without warning and they have no rights which protect them from eviction. The very last bill signed by Obama before he left office was a bill intended to bail out real estate equity investors. Yet we are supposed to believe, almost five years later, that the current real estate crisis has not been foreseen and is happening very suddenly. The assistance promoted by Biden to help renters does not directly assist the renters. The funds go directly to landlords, who then use that money to pay banks. Yet, even that is only if the landlord accepts that assistance and if local governments disperse that money. To date, only 10% of that money has been distributed. A landlord can refuse to accept government funds, and many are doing precisely that. They can evict the tenant, sue the destitute tenant, claim losses for tax purposes, and increase the rent for the next tenant. The effects of all of this has been such increases in real estate prices and rent that the vast majority of Americans no longer have any hope of buying any kind of any of the few remaining homes on the market their chances of renting are de and options for renting are decreased equity investors are buying properties before the properties are publicly listed and bidding above the listing price sometimes by tens of thousands of dollars hundreds of thousands and even millions of dollars Regular people have no chance to compete. Then, properties are rented out at prices elevated so much that many renters, now with evictions on their records, are locked out of renting as well as buying. To be fair to Biden, even before the pandemic struck, we already had a housing crisis in process. Several alleged progressive officials had proposed bills to address this, yet when viewed closely, objectively, every one of them did not help residents nearly as much as they helped capitalist landlords, and that is where the funding was directed. Section 8 housing has always subsidized capitalist landlords while generally ignoring any housing standards. At this time, more than half of Americans aged 18 to 29 are living at home with their families, more than during the Great Depression. There are no numbers available for how many Americans now share housing to reduce expenses. Even defining such criteria would be more than slightly difficult, so it is unlikely that we could gain a measurement which is anywhere near to being accurate. On a national average, rent has increased by 14% since the beginning of 2021. In limited areas, rent has increased as much as 24% since January of 2020. It is ironic that during the Cold War, Americans criticized that there were generally false reports, which they believed, of multiple families living in single residences in Russia. The truth is that Russian apartments were generally single-family dwellings, roughly the same size as apartments found throughout Europe. Many were built before World War II and later ones often built to the same sizes as before World War II. Today we see multiple families or roommates cohabiting in single apartments or homes right here in the U.S. Barely a word is spoken from the media while nationalists will defend 
defend this situation and criticize those forced to live in such conditions rather than criticize the system which creates these conditions. There has been discussion from capitalist media that the shortage of housing on the market indicates a need to build more housing. However, the number of empty residences in this country far exceeds the number of homeless. And that's including homeless by any measure. Note that there was no discussion of a shortage of residences in the United States prior to the last 18 months when speculators began moving investments from the unstable stock market into real estate equity, causing the situation that we now face. That alone tells you there is no shortage of housing. It is very obvious that all of this is a situation which capitalism has created and which destabilizes the entire economy. One aspect that destabilizes the economy. The more money which people must devote to simply keeping, keeping a roof over their heads means less money they are able to spend on food, clothing, medical care, transportation, etc. So that results in a severe decrease in consumer spending, which supports jobs on an everyday basis. This is money which is not spent at small businesses or even at corporate retail businesses, meaning fewer workers are necessary at those retail locations. It can mean a reduction of worker hours, layoffs, or complete closure of retail stores and outlets. The same retail outlets could well be where many renters or homeowners with mortgages or rental agreements are employed, leaving them with less income or no income to pay for that roof over their heads. But the capitalists would be happy because they can evict that person, increase rent for a new tenant, or buy the property at a reduced price to do exactly the same thing. I've said many times that capitalism cannot offer any solution to any problem which only exists because of capitalism. Some on the left suggest such solutions as rent controls. However, rent controls tend to be applied in limited geographic areas and they are not permanent. So how could we potentially solve this issue, not just temporarily or in limited areas? The most valid suggestion would be placing hard limits on residential equity real estate ownership. Numbers would have to be openly debated and calculated, but by limiting the hard numbers of how much residential real estate can be owned by individuals and businesses, we could open the real estate market to more homeowners and more small landlords. The result would be more small business owners and a far more affordable housing market for the long term. Equity owners should not be allowed to own thousands of homes or even apartments, which serve only to monopolize housing, driving up the cost of housing to unaffordable degrees. Placing limits on such monopolization is not unreasonable. Such limits exist in other countries, such as most of Europe. Of course, even suggesting this will mean facing major battles against well-funded capitalists with teams of lawyers along with corporate media. It will mean hearing arguments that this is not realistic 
and that it somehow violates the Constitution, which it does not. In fact, the conditions caused by capitalists on the housing in this country most likely violate the Constitution, infringing on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for a huge percentage of Americans. Constitutional arguments aside, it absolutely impacts human rights in very real ways. Once again, this is an issue which would require mass popular support and movements. Yet the first step in this is bringing the discussion to the public consciousness, making this a part of the national conversation. Yet the biggest part of these ideas is hope. We cannot give in to fear and demoralization. We have to be willing to genuinely fight the forces in power and wrest our control back from them. That does not mean using violence, which is generally counterproductive. Each one of these ideas I present are things which will be long battles to engage in, but well worth it in the long term. Each victory, each instance of broadening awareness of the possibilities for real change helps in ways uncounted. Raising hope is the first step. We have to believe in what we are doing. There is no other way. So please, Share this video or article. Uh, discuss these subjects extensively. If you can, please donate a dollar a month to help expand the channel. And this is Russell Myers for Issues Unite. Thank you for watching or reading. I'll catch you in the next one.